All right, guys, welcome back to Required Reading, uh, where this week we are starting off with Chapter 13 of the novelization of Gremlins 2, The New Batch, which, of course, is written by uh, David Bischoff. Uh, it was based on the motion picture written by Charlie Haas and characters created by Chris Columbus. Leading a tour group through the Clamp Center was no treat at the best of times, but when you were worried about an imminent gremlin infestation, as Kate Berenger was, it made things much more difficult. She couldn't get the images of those gooey, smelly cocoons out of her mind. Cocoons hatching and disgorging those... those awful things... When she was tending bar at the tavern back in Kingston Falls, she'd served some pretty seriously weird characters, but those gremlins had been like intense parodies of all the sins of humanity. They sure had torn the hell out of that tavern. Imagine what they could do to New York City. Of course, there was always the possibility that maybe even gremlins wouldn't be able to deal with Manhattan. Kate's tour group this morning included the usual crowd of Hawaiian shirt-garbed people from the hinterlands and European tourists in shorts, sandals, and white socks. Her lone Japanese tourist was a young man who had formally introduced himself. His name was Katsuchi, and before the tour started, he'd presented her with a small package of super lemon candy with a sincere bow. She'd thought that was sweet. But as the tour progressed, young Katsuchi began to get on her nerves. The guy was absolutely freighted with an arsenal of photography equipment. Dozens of cameras and lenses hung on him like high-tech ornaments on a bonsai Christmas tree. Among this assortment was the latest Sony video camcorder, slung around his neck like a Star Wars laser weapon. The problem was that he was so busy using this equipment to record the tour that he kept falling behind the group. Not only was losing tour group members frowned upon by the administration, but Kate was also supposed to complete the tour in an amount of time specified by one of the Clamp Corporation's efficiency experts. By the third time Kate had halted the tour in order to chase after him, Kate was beginning to lose patience with Katsuchi. Sir, said Kate, trying to stay pleasant and finding it very, very hard. I'm sorry, but you have to keep up with the rest of the group. Katsuchi paid no attention to Kate's scold. He merely focused his camcorder on her. Excellent, thank you. Please, give me some right profile as you continue speaking. Kate shook her head and gave up. She went to the front of the group again. As I was saying, these are the studios of the Clamp Cable Networks. Now, if you're all very quiet, we can go in here and watch a program being videotaped. She led her group into Studio C. Right now, they were taping Microwave Marge. It was not one of Clamp Studios' more sterling productions, but this was the one the studio would let the tourists into. The studio was your typical dark cave around a tacky set made bright and photogenic with expert lighting. Microwave Marge was gushing now over her latest creations as she sat a tray of grayish canaps down beside a hot aromatic Vienna sausage casserole. Now, this week here on Microwave with Marge is a special salute to luncheon meats, and I'm very excited about these recipes, so let's jump in with some hors d'oeuvres. You know, these bologna and bean dip roll-ups are so easy when friends drop over. And if you want to make it a little extra special, you can get some of these little sword-shaped toothpicks. You put these through the bologna, and that's our Viva Zapata appetizer. People are simply crazy about these. Downstairs in Clamp Center Control Headquarters, 
Forrester waited impatiently while the technicians quizzed Billy. The discussion had become something like a Sunday school class discussion of theology among doubting wiseacre kids. Okay, wait, said one technician, a guy in something close to a crew cut. What if one of them eats something at 11 o'clock, but he gets something stuck in his teeth? Yeah, like, like a caraway seed. Uh, whatever, right. And, and then after 12 o'clock, it comes out. Now, he didn't eat that after midnight. Look, I didn't make the rules, said Billy. There are... The rules? said Forrester, shaking his head. I can't believe this. What, 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 what if he's eating in an airplane and he crossed the time zone, suggested another. And everyone started laughing at the ludicrous thought. Laughing, that was, until two big green scaly arms burst out of the console, ripping aside control buttons and speaker grills in a burst of sparks and smoke. Oh, God, thought Billy, too paralyzed with fear to move immediately. It's happening. Clawed fingers closed around a technician's throat and pulled him down to bash him against the control board. A particularly ugly and nasty gremlin emerged. A gremlin wearing its multicolored hair mohawk style. With an evil leer, the mohawked gremlin continued to choke his new victim. Help me! The guy cried. Forrester took off, getting as much distance as possible between himself and the gremlin. Another technician went to the colleague's aid. The mohawked gremlin slashed his arm with sharp fingernails and whooped with nasty glee. Billy shined a flashlight in Mohawk's face. Screeching, the gremlin raced away into the darkness for cover. Forrester and the technician stared at one another with total bewilderment. And then they looked at Billy Peltzer as though they'd seen him for the very first time. Microwave Marge stood in her jerry-built super-suburban kitchen set. A soup pot rested on a kitchen stove and a match flared in Microwave Marge's hand. This is how we used to cook for big groups before we had our microwave ovens and other modern appliances. It would take days. She turned on the gas and she lit the burner. Days to plan the menu in absolute hours over a hot, hot stove to do the cooking. But now we can make this same tuna noodle cheese product chowder surprise in just a few minutes. And you can feed anything from a high school reunion to a complete Georgia chain gang with this kind of quantity. She clapped the lid onto the mammoth soup pot. Now, if we step over here... Suddenly, the lights flashed on and off. Marge looked around, more annoyance on her face than surprise. Huh? Is this a brownout or something? From somewhere came a tap, tap, tapping. Microwave Marge gazed around her. Wherever was that noise coming from? When she realized that it was coming from the pot, now that was when Microwave Marge became truly surprised. This surprise was significantly compounded when she reached over and opened the gigantic soup pot. A gremlin stood up, trailing wilted celery and strands of noodles, grinning goofily. Even though he was now a gremlin, the thing could be recognized as something that had once been Linny the Mogwai. He looked like a gremlin gorilla after a lobotomy. He whipped out a turkey baster and squirted microwave marge with it, sending soup all over her face, her apron, and her spanking clean shirt. Oh, cried microwave marge. What is it? Harsh, awful laughter sounded behind her. She turned to find herself confronted with another gremlin, the former George the Mogwai, dressed in an apron and chef's cap, eyes gleaming with anticipation at the prospect of fixing a lovely, lovely dinner. 
As Marge turned to the cameraman, waving wildly for some kind of assistance, George the Gremlin turned his evil eye upon the gigantic microwave oven in the very middle of the set. And boy, was it a beauty. A Japanese number from a brand new outfit in Japan called Nougat. This baby was loaded with a gigawatt generator that crisped bacon the second it started a buzzin' and a hummin'. Marge's pride and joy, it shone and sparkled, freshly cleaned with clamp detergents, lemon all four in one cleanser by her hands alone. Microwave, said George the Gremlin. The Gremlin raced dementedly around the kitchen, grabbing metal pots and tossing them into the open door. When the nougat microwave was chock full, the Gremlin slammed the door closed tapped the controls onto full max, and pressed the start button. The nuke it. Nuked it. With a rattling hum, the microwave started beaming the metal pots. As an expert on the subject, Microwave Marge knew well what happened when you put metal in the microwave oven. And lo and behold, here was lots and lots of metal in a very powerful microwave oven turned up to full power. Look out, said Marge. For when microwaves hit metal, they arc. And when there's lots and lots of metal, they arc and arc a lot. The microwave oven zapped and flashed with blue light. Arcs flung themselves hither and thither with incredible raging violence. The microwave oven rocked back and forth like the brave little toaster that could, but didn't. It blew. The set was showered with glass. People screamed and ran. Seeing her precious microwave oven explode was too much for Microwave Marge. Let's get the hell out of here, she said, grabbing her cameraman. She pulled him after her, and they escaped together. Flames licked up towards the ceiling from the havoc in the wreckage, and the gremlins cackled with totally evil glee. Chapter 14 Booms fell noisily, gremlins mooned live cameras, beaming their green and knobby butts out throughout the astonished nation of America. Fortunately, though, the cameras were soon trashed and the transmission cut off, or doubtless thousands and thousands of Americans would either have gone mad or simply changed the channel. Elsewhere in the building, equal pandemonium reigned. For example, it certainly hovered like a fury around Gizmo the Mogwai. One of the gremlins had the poor guy scotch taped down on the top of a photocopy machine. The awful creature was busy taking copy after copy of the unfortunate Mogwai. Indeed, it was none other than Mohawk, come back to commit sadistic havoc upon the helpless creature. Back down in the clamp center system's control, the technicians were both somber and very, very rattled. After all, it isn't every day that little green monsters invade a skyscraper. They worked urgently at their consoles. A panicked forester paced behind them, from time to time glancing at their monitor screens with total disbelief. Mr. Forrester, said one to the boss, I show lighting brownouts in five locations. I've got a climate control malfunction, floors 15 and 16. What the hell is going on? said Forrester, raising his arms as though entreating heaven itself. Ah, uh, sir? He took a few steps and indicated a monitor. The pest infestation monitor? On the screen was an alarmingly rapid proliferation of dots spreading over the building diagram. Forrester said, "'What is that? That's not rats, is it?' "'No, sir. I'm afraid it's not.' A video phone rang near Technician 3. He grabbed it. "'Systems control,' he barked into the phone. Kate Behringer's face filled the video phone screen. "'Is Billy Peltzer there, please?' "'No,' answered the technician." He said he was going to Mr. Clamp's office. Hey, do you know anything about... Thank you. Upstairs at the video phone, Kate Behringer hung up. She ran toward the elevator and got on. 38, 
she demanded, expecting the obnoxious but familiar voice to respond. Thirty-eight, babe, screeched a gremlin voice in its place. Horrified, Kate tried to get out, but the door slammed shut in her face, and the elevator started moving, and then jerked to a sudden stop. At the very tippy top of the huge structure that is the Clamp Center resides a whole suite of offices insulated from the rest of the building by more than just distance and man-made materials. It was here where the famous Daniel Clamp wheeled and dealed and generally operated his expansive and growing, growing, growing empire with the glee of a little boy playing Monopoly by himself and cheating. Daniel Clamp sat at his desk. He was a tall, angular man. Some people said that he looked like a skinny Gary Cooper, while others claimed he looked more like Jimmy Stewart after a couple of years of working out. Daniel Clamp liked to say that he looked like a young Billy Graham, who just found out that people weren't really going to hell after all, and that he could drink and womanize as much as he wanted and still get through those wondrous pearly gates. Not that Daniel Clamp drank much, or, for that matter, womanized. Hell no. Unlike his arch-rival Donald Trump, he didn't really care to share his toys with anyone. The fact that he could do just about anything he wanted to was enough to keep him happy for minutes at a time. Daniel Clamp sat at his desk, looking out at the expanse of neatly placed office stuff atop the high-polished teak. All high-designer stuff. Expensive as hell. And the funny thing was, Clamp was bored with it. He sighed. Daniel Clamp stood up from his desk. He walked to the windows. The freshly cleaned windows sparkled in the morning light, and he looked out onto the skyline of Manhattan. His eyes darted from building to building to building. Mine. 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 If the laws of real estate were location, 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 then right now Clamp Enterprises was New York, New York, New York. The city so nice they named it thrice. The Trump era had the Big Apple. He was working on the Big Orange out west, and his encroaching takeovers were the talk of the financial world. And to think, it all started with a 50,000-watt radio station in Peoria. A disc jockey with dreams, an old Ford pickup truck, and an inheritance of a mere $50 million worth of real estate. Ah, yes, thought Clamp, looking out across the East River with vast satisfaction. Those had been the days. Still, things in the office were getting a tad dull today. No big takeovers due until next week. No celebrity balls or sports events until this weekend. His lunch with Liz Taylor at the Four Seasons wasn't until 12.30, and his date with the season's hot model wasn't until 8 o'clock tonight. What was a poor, bored billionaire to do? Daniel Clamp pushed the button on his intercom. Miss Jones, have you shredded my mail from this morning? The voice came back promptly and efficiently from the pert and pretty secretary. I'm just finishing them now, Mr. Clamp. Good. Let's do some memos. Yes, sir. Just a moment, sir. Make it snappy, Miss Jones. I'm a busy, busy man. Yes, sir. What to do? What to do? The billionaire cast about. His eyes were caught by something on the far wall. The entirety of this section had been set up like a gigantic television and radio control center, with monitors and such stretched out in banks. Screening now upon a monitor, and presumably being broadcast now upon one of Clamp's several cable stations, was the Frank Capra classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Jimmy Stewart was running down the snow-covered street now, yelling, Merry Christmas, movie house! Merry Christmas, drugstore! And it was an affront to Daniel Clamp's eyes. It was in black and white. What could be wrong? Clamp scowled. 
He stalked over the banks of controls and looked down. Relief flooded him. Oh, of course. Just a little glitch. A smile of control and pleasure swept over his well-defined features as he reached over and turned a knob. Computer-generated color washed over the black and white classic. Clamp sighed with relief and pleasure. Clamp knew what the public wanted. Always did. Always would. The outer office, fronting the huge interior of Clamp's Sanctum Sanctorium, was manned, or were manned, rather, by Linda Jones, a secretary of uncompromising efficiency, enormous breasts, pneumatic legs, and the morals of an alley cat. Needless to say, she was going far in Clamp Enterprises. Just now, she was pushing a letter through the shredder off to the right. It was a big shredder, absolutely the latest model. The Ollie North Shredder, it was called. When Daniel Clamp's voice erupted over the intercom, she snapped to immediate attention, her blonde hair flouncing over her shoulders. She popped her bubblegum, then picked up the stenopad. Memo time. Yes, sir. Pen poised to paper, she was ready. Mr. Clamp didn't like to dictate to her in person because he got all confused trying to talk while she and her breasts were in the room. First one, uh, to Fraser in public relations, let's have the people in Chinatown give a street festival as a spontaneous outpouring of appreciation for what I've done for their community. Miss Jones generally skipped breakfast to give herself more time for makeup application. She usually picked up a sandwich at the health food store downstairs for a mid-morning snack. Today it was a peanut butter and banana sandwich. Little did this vision of sexy secretariness realize it, but slinking beneath her desk was something far more nefarious than her silk stocking. And he had plans for that sandwich. While she was busy taking down the memo from Mr. Clamp, the gremlin, Mohawk in fact, stood up behind her, opened her sandwich, and stuck a cocked acme mousetrap between the slices of bread. Stifling a snigger, the gremlin darted back under the desk and waited for the fun. It was not long before it came. Linda Jones got hungry, and she reached for the sandwich. She pulled it to her mouth and took just the biggest bite her petite mouth could manage. Sap! Linda Jones screamed. But when the little green monster jumped up from behind her desk, that was when she really screamed. Inside his vast office domain, Daniel Clamp heard his secretary scream a scream of pain and fear. Daniel Clamp was many things, but he was no coward. A lesser man would have simply locked the door and dialed security, but Daniel Clamp was a pure American, and he rushed to the aid of a distressed damsel. He burst through the door to the outer office to find a most astonishing sight. There, behind the desk of Linda Jones, was the ugliest little monster he had ever seen, green and evil as Ted Turner's socks, wearing his secretary's pink sweater, sitting in her chair and tapping madly at a computer keyboard. A horrible leer spread from ear to demon ear. "'You're not my secretary,' said Daniel Clamp. The gremlin responded by grabbing a silex pot of boiling hot water from the nearby coffee station and flinging the water at Clamp. Daniel Clamp ducked. Clamp played squash, so he had excellent reflexes. The beastie threw the pot. Clamp ducked again, and the pot smashed against a wall. With a nasty shriek, the punkish gremlin jumped at Clamp, its claws outstretched, its eyes wild and commenced ripping and tearing. But Clamp was no 98-pound weakling. Not with regular exercise with a trainer in his own personal gym. Clamp batted the thing back successfully, pushing it back like a boxer bashing at an opponent. The gremlin fell back, and its foot fell onto the hopper of the huge Ollie North Shredder. 
Hating to do it, but seeing no other way of dealing with the thing, Daniel Clamp reached over and pushed the on button. And he pushed the mohawked gremlin down into the shredder. Chapter 15 Billy Peltzer raced into the office just in time to witness the demise of Mohawk the Gremlin. Even for a Gremlin, it was a pretty nasty way to go. Daniel Clamp was pushing it into the shredder. Mohawk was fighting and squawking all the way, spitting and roaring, but it was no good. Inexorably, he was being pushed down through the blades, which roared away hungrily, chopping him up real good, sending gremlin stuff spattering and splattering in all directions. Billy winced. Good riddance, though. Billy had long since come to the realization that the only good gremlin was a dismembered or melted gremlin, a gremlin rendered incapable of the usual bags of mischief they dispensed. Yes, Mohawk fought all the way and only stopped struggling once the last of his odd haircut disappeared within the gnashing blades and gears of the shredder. Underneath the glop and shreds shuddered a few times, and then were still. Sir, said Billy, rushing up to Daniel Clamp, are you all right? Daniel Clamp seemed to be trying to regain his composure and poise, which was quite difficult for a guy when you're splattered with gremlin gunk. I think so. I hate using those machines myself. Sir, I have to talk to you. There are a... Just that moment, Frank Forrester chose to barge in fighting to look calm, but clearly white as a sheet and quite disheveled. Mr. Clamp, there's a situation in... He stopped in his track, staring at the quite yucky remains of Mohawk in the waste bin, and still dribbling out from the shredder and nasty gobs. My God, what? Billy took his opportunity. He had to get his word into the guy really in charge before Forrester botched things up totally and thoroughly. Sir, please listen to me. There are more of these things, maybe lots more. We've got to get the people out of the building, and we've got to close the building up. We've got to do it before sundown. Clamp looked up with alarm and interest. Yeah? What happens at sundown? These... Things can't stand sunlight. It'll kill them. But once it's nighttime, they can get out into New York City. If that happens, Forrester pointed an accusing finger at Billy. He should be in custody. He's dangerous. Dangerous? Clamp shook his head. This thing that was here a minute ago, that was dangerous. This guy's from the art department. Yeah? said Forrester, and his own particular brand of anal retentive glare directed at Billy Peltzer. Ask him how he knows so much about these green things. That's a good question, Billy, said Clamp, turning to Billy. How do you know about them? Uh, well, um, Billy said, time to desperately dissemble. Uh, you know that genetics laboratory down on... Clamp's eyes flared. Of course. Those guys. He turned to Forrester. I warned you that could be a problem, Tenet. That we could have had three shrinks and a plastic surgeon in that space, but no. I thought, sir... Uh, I mean, I, th I thought that they were part of your whole plan. What? Genetics? I do what I understand, Bill. And I certainly don't understand genetics. I've got nothing to do with those people, but clearly I shouldn't have let them into the building. But how do you know so much about them? I, uh... I read science fiction and fantasy. Oh... Of course, I yeah. I like sci-fi films. I own the rights to hundreds and hundreds. I've seen them all. 
horror films, too. I especially like that one about the werewolves. Uh, what's it called? The Jowling? That one by that nice Italian boy with the nasty sense of humor. Sir, we really have to get back on track here, insisted Billy. Oh, right. Sorry, Bill. Sir, continued Billy, we have to make sure that none of these things get wet. If that happens, I'll tell you what we have to do. We have to get a lid on this thing and keep it on. No cops, no media. We'll handle it. He turned to Forrester. Go down to systems control and get on top of this thing. Me? Uh, but there might be... You're supposed to be getting the bugs out of this building, right? Well, I would call these some pretty major bugs, wouldn't you? Forrester had to nod with agreement, but he did get a nasty glance at Billy in. Okay, right, but I don't think I should try it without an expert. Bitter sarcasm on the last word. Let's go, pal. Together, Billy and Forrester trooped on down to systems control deep in the heart of the clamp center. Meanwhile, everything in the clamp center was going absolutely big-time old-fashioned Looney Tunes crazy. The gremlin manifestations were getting worse. Evidently, the gremlins were multiplying even as they increased in size and danger and total outrageousness. And Kate... Poor, dear, sweet Kate was still stuck in that elevator between floors. Nor did she particularly care for it. Help! she cried. Help! She punched every button on the control panel till her fingers hurt, but they were as dead as grocery store chickens. The elevator started to rock violently, jerking Kate about willy-nilly. Desperately, Kate punched the alarm button. Nothing happened. The only sound she heard was the clamor of countless claws outside, pounding and scraping at the elevator car. Suddenly, that awful elevator voice started speaking again, resurrected from the dead. You have selected a floor that is not part of the building at this time. Gremlin laughter slid into the elevator like a cascade of cackles straight from the heart of hell itself. She saw claws tearing from the corners of the elevator, rending through the cheap synthetic material that comprised the elevator car to get at her. What could she do? What she could do, she knew, was not give up. She had fought these little monsters before and won. They were imminently defeatable, just very, very persistent, and even more numerous. She shrank away from the sound and the threat, her hands braced against the walls. Down at the base of the elevator controls was none other than Daffy the Gremlin. Clamp Cable Network now leaves the air. We hope you have enjoyed our programming. But more importantly, we hope you have enjoyed life. <laughs> <laughs>